We all know that real estate has created more millionaires than any other industry on the planet. We also know that it has created a lot of heartache due to mismanagement, overborrowing, and just simple life events that happen to all of us. Welcome to the Cash Flow Pro Podcast. My name is Casey Brown, and I am your fearless leader. And although we might be bourbon sipping and at times foul mouth Southerners, we will always do our best to be honest, straightforward, and due diligent with all of the information we pass along to you. Welcome to the show. Hey there, and welcome to today's episode of Cash Flow Pro, your daily real estate investing podcast and YouTube channel. I'm here today with David Robinson, and I got to admit, David, whenever I uh, um, saw your name come across, I was really, really praying for somebody that was like eight foot tall and was <laughs> an epic, epic basketball player, but instead we got stuck with you. So <laughs> I'm just kidding, man. No, we're glad you're I am. I am the short white version <laughs> of David Robinson. Yeah. Man, it's cool, dude. Uh, it, it, you know, I, I was like, man, if I, if I, I just, was thinking, I was like, man, if I could, if I had David Robinson on here, man, I mean, you know, there's so many questions you got to ask about that, those years. <laughs> but anyway, so man, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Excited to be here and looking forward to our conversation. Awesome. Well, David is with Kenobo Capital and he is more than, um, uh, he's wants to talk about raising capital, about syndications, about basically everything that we cover on this show. And I can't wait to kind of dig in here and figure out, you know, what things you do, what things you do maybe differently than, than some of the rest of us or, or some of the rest of the listeners. So, uh, David, why don't you kind of uh, leave your basketball uh, career out of your backstory <laughs> and let's chat about uh, where you came from, how you got where you are, and, and we'll kind of go from there. Well, uh, real estate is almost all I've ever known. Mm -hmm. Um my career started when I was fired by my dad at my first real job, which was working for his small independent uh, mechanical engineering firm. Wow. I was going to, I was going to college. I just returned home from a two year church service mission and I uh, was working him, working for him, going to college and I screwed some stuff up. Uh, for the for the last time, and he finally got fed up with uh, my mishandling of uh, the item that I was dealing with, and uh, we both uh, decided that uh, it was time to part ways. And that was so that was really my first foray into realizing, okay, I don't know that I'm cut out for this employee type, um, you know, environment. And uh, from there, I decided to pursue real estate full time. I actually dropped out of college. Uh, went full time as a real estate agent. I got my real estate license and immediately began, you know, learning the real estate business from a broker agent perspective. Sure. I spent uh, I've spent the last roughly 18 years in the real estate business. The the vast majority of the first part of my career was in managing residential sales teams and a national franchise brokerage. And a handful of years back, about five years ago. Uh, I looked up and realized that I had been doing well in the real estate business, making a good income, but I hadn't done nearly enough um, in regards to building my own personal wealth and cash flow. And uh, it was sort of an aha moment. I got a call from my, uh, my mom one day. Uh, about five years ago, and dad uh, had just gotten out of a heart surgery. The heart surgery went very well. He had been home for the last couple of days and um, had been feeling horrible and ultimately had gone septic. He got an infection during the surgery, oh, had gone man. septic, basically died. They revived him on the ambulance in the ambulance ride to the hospital. They revived him. He ended up making it. But that was my aha moment when I realized, okay, something's got to give. I really have to hunker down and focus on building wealth for me and my family. And so I shifted my entire business from residential, traditional residential brokerage business 
to the uh, investor side of the business. And so I started serving investor clients and I still have that brokerage today. So uh, there's two parts to my business. There's the brokerage business, which is serving buy and hold investors who are looking to acquire small scale multifamily property for their own personal portfolios here in Utah, the greater Utah Valley. Awesome. Um, anything, when I say small scale, I'm referring to anything under roughly $5 million, all the way down to your typical fourplex. Got gotcha. you. Gotcha. So we help those clients. And then I also have the uh, syndication side of the business um, that I'm happy to dive into and talk about why I transitioned and all that, if you'd like. Sure, sure. Man, <clears throat> your story sounds like, dude, it's almost identical to mine in where, although I am a few years into that, that shift, probably not quite as far in as you have been for as many years into the shift of saying, Hey, you know, I looked at it when my aha moment hit, I was like, man, I sold 73 properties last year, right? On the sales side, residential, single family residential up to, you know, a, a few smaller commercial deals. And I was like, this is, this is great. And it's okay. It's, it's not fun because everything is like pulling teeth. And then I was like, all right, I made decent money, but how are these people making generate like generational wealth? Really? Right. And, and, and when I sat down I was like, what's the difference in what I'm doing? And when I realized that it was such a transactional business, and the transactional part of it was really, it was, it was for all intents and purposes, suffocating me because it's because you work so hard to get that transaction across the line. You get that $10,000 commission check. You know what? You turn around, you spend that $10,000 commission check. Then you got to go for the next one. Then you got to go for the next one. And if that next one doesn't come and you can get your ass in a pinch real quick. And so it's almost identical, man, all the way down to my dad had to have heart surgery, uh, although mm. his was earlier on and uh, it was in two, matter of fact, it was 10 years ago yesterday. No, oh, uh, wow. 11 years ago yesterday. And so it's just, you know, those kind of things wake you up in life. And, and when, when I'm sitting there and like you said, you just, you begin to reflect on saying, man, what, what, you know, what am I doing here to protect my future, my kid's future? You know, not that once they hit 18 or 20 years old, not that I necessarily have to so much worry about them, but nevertheless, you know, you've got to do it. So I love that part of that, that you really highlighted the fact that the sales part of it and how you transitioned that into one side kind of serves the other now really. Right. Absolutely. I mean, that was really, uh, I knew, I didn't know exactly how I was going to go about building wealth and passive income. Uh, I explored a handful of different paths when I decided that it was time, you know, after that aha moment with my dad, recognizing that I hadn't uh, accomplished what I needed to um, uh, from a cash flow and a wealth building perspective, I made that transition. I just didn't know exactly how that was going to happen. I had a mentor of mine, a friend of mine that I went to lunch with. I talked to him about this sort of what was going on in my head. And he really encouraged me to get into multifamily. And so uh, the, the closest proximity, uh, you know, shift was, okay, I'm already a broker. I'm already in the broker, uh, you know, the, the real estate brokerage space. Let's just make a slight pivot yep. into the multifamily space, the investment property space, and start serving clients in that space and really focus in that area. And so I dove headlong into it, uh, left the, the residential brokerage that I was at, uh, started my own brokerage and started down this path of multifamily and started with working with clients that were looking to buy small scale multifamily and uh, have been very successful with that. We've served a lot of clients. We love working with our clients that are looking to buy that product type. But what I realized is that I was having, you know, dozens of investor calls on a monthly basis. Yeah. And many of those investor calls ended up going into the conversation with that investor wanting to buy small multifamily property for their own personal portfolio what? and coming out the other end realizing, oh my gosh, I actually don't want to own that fourplex or <laughs> that triplex. 
<laughs> Why did I know Black. that was the next step? Why did I know that? I don't even know how I knew that. That's <laughs> oh and so that was sort of the aha moment for me was number yeah. one, um, I had built, I'd put a lot of effort into building a large uh, multifamily investor network, over yep. 2,500 quality buy and hold investors in my network at this point in time. And a very large percentage of that network has zero interest in owning small scale multifamily. They thought they did, but That's when right. it really comes down to it, they just want all the benefits of owning real estate. They don't necessarily want to actually have to deal with the personal ownership of the real estate. I mean, you mean they don't like changing light bulbs and worrying about HVAC systems on Saturday afternoons and well, and, 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 and that's the common, you know, that's the common, you know, line that I often use is, Hey, you know, the toilets, tenants, termites, all that. The reality is there's ways to own small scale multifamily and build your own personal portfolio where it's less management, personal management intensive. Like you hire third party management companies, there's ways to do it, but here's the reality. They still have to go through a process of learning how to invest in those type of properties. You still That's have right. to manage the manager. You still have to underwrite the deal and be knowledgeable about the deal. And you have to go and get your own financing. And then, you know, there's all these pieces. So the reality is, yeah, a lot of my investors were busy professionals, business owners who thought that they wanted to build their own portfolio, but didn't. And so that caused me to then start to explore alternative ways to help this segment of my investor network that didn't want to own the real estate. They just wanted yep. to, to, to invest in it. And yep. that's when I started to explore some different things, including like, um, you know, uh, buying turnkey rentals, partnering with a turnkey rental company in the Midwest and helping them get involved with that. I determined that wasn't the path I wanted to go. Ultimately, I was exposed to the syndication model and how I could partner with quality operators in other parts of the country, pre-vet uh, them as an operator and a sponsor, vet their deal, and then partner with them and be a conduit for my investor network to participate in uh, you know, commercial grade uh, multifamily assets that they otherwise wouldn't have a desire or even know about. That's right. Man, that's, I mean, even the further on you go, it's like everything that you say is just, and I, I got to imagine if you and I are both sitting here looking at this saying, hey, these are things that, that, that we decided were what we wanted to do, that there's got to be a slew of other people out there because I find myself typically there's some people below, some people under, or some people below me, some people above me, and I'm pretty well an average person, right? And so when you start looking at it like that, man, I mean, and you start thinking, okay, what can I do to to translate to these folks that they can own this real estate and they don't have to worry about all the T's, toilets, termites, tenants, uh, I, you know, that kind of stuff. And 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 so the 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 way that you can translate that is really where I feel like you could pick up some people and pick up some interest. But what did you, so, so with all of that being said and, and me being in full agreement and full understanding of exactly where you were and where you went to and where you are now, let's talk a little bit about, I want to, I, I want to kind of dive just a little bit in towards the syndication part of this and say, okay, because there's a lot of people out there who, who are noticing that maybe they are a decent operator, right? But they just don't know how to take down a $10 million apartment building or you know, even a $5 million apartment building for that matter. And of course, we all know you raise a million, you borrow four, voila, right? But I want to hear a little bit more about like, let's say, let's just go and talk about your first deal, no matter if it was a duplex or a hundred units, whatever that first deal was where you actually raised outside capital had a key principle or whatever, or maybe you took the note out, whatever. Let's talk about that. Um, I'll use two examples. The first is okay. um, my first acquisition of a commercial multifamily property. It was not structured as a syndication. It was a joint venture, but I think there's a few points to illustrate here. Number one is I started where I felt comfortable. Um, 
I couldn't wrap my head around how to go about acquiring, you know, a, a $25 million to a $40 million apartment building. That took time for me to sort of understand the concepts and understand the process and the business model. Um, so I started where I could, which was in my own backyard with a property that I felt like was pushing me a little bit out of my boundary, right? So uh, I ended up buying a 14 unit apartment building just south of Salt Lake City. Uh, I bought it completely off market, direct from owner through direct mail, um, negotiated a contract, uh, brought a partner. That's like what everybody always hears about, but nobody ever, that's like the golden nugget, yeah, right? Yeah, it, it happens. It works. It just takes persistency and, uh, persistence and consistency over time. So sure. um, I can go into the details of that, but I'll just sort of highlight the points, which are um, got the deal under contract. I had already started building my investor network. I knew I had two partners that would be perfect partners for this deal. It actually ended up not being a deal that I was really super excited about, but I knew they would be excited about it. It was perfect for them. They owned a property management company here locally that manages uh, you know, a handful of other assets that were just exactly like this, which was 1970s construction, two bed, one bath, uh, 800 square foot units. Um, so they knew this product and it was right up their alley. So um, I, I got it under contract. I went through the whole due diligence process. I brought them into the picture. They were excited about it. We joint ventured on the deal. I, uh, I actually had zero of my own money in that deal uh, at the end of the day, and I held an equity position with them. So we joint ventured on it. They brought, they 1031 exchange from another property, had all the capital for that. So that was my first foray. I think it's important for people that are starting to like, uh, yes, you want to push yourself, but sometimes it doesn't necessarily make, I learned so much on that transaction um, that helped me get into uh, the larger syndication deals and to understand what goes on sure. behind the scenes on those types of syndication deals. So that, that was the very first deal. Then I realized, okay, I know that my investor network has an appetite for getting involved passively in larger commercial transactions. And so I started to build a network with other operators that were across the country in particular in the Midwest, we were in a high, we are in a high growth market here in Utah. I mean, obviously all across the country, high growth, yeah. but Utah yeah. is a low cash flow, high growth state right now, especially uh, as a, uh, as it relates to multifamily. So for me, yeah. I wanted, I knew that my investors had an appetite for more cash flow. And so I sought out locations that generally had a better, um, better chance of producing a higher uh, cash on cash return, maybe a little bit lower yep. equity, but a little bit more stable. So I was generally looking in some of the Midwest markets and Kansas City was one of those and uh, identified an, uh, an operator that was there, um, a lead sponsor, a syndicator, a bunch of different terminology that's used for individuals that are running syndications and leading syndications. They were entrenched in the Kansas City market. Um, I had been building a relationship with this person for about a year before we did a deal together. And uh, by the time uh, we had been in contact, we had done some coaching together. I had been prepping my investor network for these type of deals. I had been sending emails to my investors, asking them, sort of polling them on um, whether or not they would be interested in partnering with us on a deal in the Midwest outside of Utah. And I had many of them that responded very positively to that. So I knew there was an appetite. So uh, ultimately, I kept notifying my partner out in Kansas City saying, hey, okay, I feel like my investors and I are ready for a deal out there. Um, on your next deal, let's really talk about it. Let's dive into it. He had a deal come up. Uh, we looked at it together. We underwrote the deal. We analyzed it. I flew out to Kansas City. I toured comps. I went through the due diligence process with them and uh, ultimately felt like this was an opportunity that would work well for what we were trying to accomplish. Nice. So I'll stop there. There's more to that story, but that's how I, that was my first foray into the syndication side of the business. Yeah. And it's interesting that you chose Kansas city because man, it's like, as of late, Kansas city has just been on fire. Like I'm talking about in the last like two years, year. I mean, not just their football team, but they've been on fire. Like everything about Kansas City has been on fire. Um, and I'm not a Chiefs fan, by the way. <laughs> um, but the 
so of I guess now I want to I want to find out why Kansas City. Now I know I know why the general idea of saying hey higher cash flow, but what other things stuck out because right now the market basically there's no cash flow in in just about anything right now. I mean there's some, but it's not where you can go out and provide a nice 9 10% pref and and just really hand out good returns right now. Obviously we think that the growth market is going to, is going to catch up and then it's going to settle a little bit and go on. But I want to know what other reasons stuck out to you about Kansas and what year are we talking about too, by the way, what year of the asset or what year? Yeah. What, what year did Kansas city get on? Uh, this, what, what year? Was this Kansas is city on? Uh, roughly 18 months ago. Okay. Uh, perfect. So, what else about Kansas City stuck out? Because you know you had about seven or eight different areas that 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 would could argue to argue arguably excuse me be along the same lines as Kansas City from a from a cash flow perspective. Yeah. My um, my answer is probably going to surprise. But my answer may surprise you. It had nothing to do with Kansas City. Uh, Kansas okay. City uh, checked a few boxes, but it came down to the sponsor for me. More than anything else, above okay. all other metrics, geographic locations, anything else, the most important thing for me in especially my first deal was the sponsor. Who was sure. I partnering with? Who, Man, who, I have, who? There's deals in Birmingham right now. Who the hell would have ever thought Birmingham would have been a hot on fire market, but it's the same situation. People are like, man, they got, we've got these, these first in class operators that have been started buying there. Right. And then all of a sudden, I mean, and that comes down to, to, to the, the, that that's a reflection on operators yeah. in general. When they can go into a market like Birmingham. Well, well to illustrate the point, I'm in just South of Salt Lake City. I'm in the greater Salt Lake City market. Sure. I find it hard to believe that someone in, um, let's call it Florida, is going to have a better mm -hmm. chance of identifying uh, quality opportunity before I do. And that's the question. That's exactly it right there. So the operators start finding those opportunities, right? Right. At least, at least that was my mindset, and it, it held true. These guys that I that I partnered with, they're entrenched in the Kansas City commercial real estate market. They have been there for five and 15, 16 years. They know that yeah. market. I, I'm I'm not going to go into that market and think that I'm going to find a better opportunity and be able to analyze that opportunity. It's not just about finding exactly. the opportunity. It's about identifying if it truly is a good yeah. opportunity because of the market dynamics, the geographic Correct. challenges or opportunities that are there, et cetera, et cetera. Well, and that's the, that's the whole thing that really, I think, keeps a lot of people from figuring this, figuring out scale like everybody wants to scale before they even start right but but then you sit down and you start looking you start taking the vision for the next 10 years and you're like okay i want to be in uh, whatever market right and it could be any of them and then people have a hard time deciding well i want to learn this market i want to learn this market what happens if something happens here and it becomes the uh it becomes a barrage of whatever you've got going on so it's interesting to finally come across my that saw a market chosen operator and said, Hey, these are my guys because those geographic fences can be awful tall for people who have lived, worked, and know a specific market. Like you said, there's very little chance that somebody from Florida is going to come into your area and know, Hey man, this apartment building over here is worth money. It's a best damn, it's the best deal I found all year. Well, he didn't know that there's a new sewer plant getting put right across right. the street. And that's why the damn thing right. is so cheap. And, and so, and, and that's what I mean by that. That's why it's interesting to me for people that, that, that just bound out of where they're at and go somewhere else. And it's, I'm glad you made that connection of saying, Hey, your operators are basically your sole resource yeah. to start. 
So, I mean, that, that was my strategy and we, we ended up acquiring that deal. It was uh, roughly a 10 million, mm -hmm. $10 million acquisition. Uh, we raised, uh, you know, roughly $3 million for that deal. Um, and, um, you know, I had prepped my investor network long before that, I, you know, I'd spent 12 months prepping my investor network for what we were about to do. Hi, this is Casey Brown, host of the Cashflow Pro podcast and YouTube channel. Have you been thinking about investing in real estate, but just don't know where to begin? I'd like to help by inviting you to check out our website at www.3000capital.com. There you will find an array of material that will help you learn all about real estate syndication. And while you're there, be sure to check out our free video series download titled Five Must Know Keys to Success in Passive Real Estate Investing. I'd also like to personally thank you for making Cashflow Pro part of your day. Now, back to the show. I had been emailing yeah. them. I had been having conversations with them about the strategy, about the benefits of investing passively. So here's an example. I have a client that, you know, many clients that own small scale multi or even single a small single family portfolio. They had built up a tremendous amount of sure. equity in those properties, right? And one of the top things that yeah. I review with my investor clients is, and and one of the uh, one of the metrics that's most important to an investor and probably the most overlooked is return on equity. So many of my investor yeah. clients get caught up on in, on their cash on cash return and uh, how much equity they have built up and what their net worth is, and they lose sight of how much how hard that equity is working for them. And so one of the first conversations yep. I have with my investor clients that already have a portfolio, a small portfolio, and especially if they bought it in the last 10 years, goodness gracious, they built up a tremendous amount of equity. The question that needs to be asked is, yep. how, is uh, how hard is that equity working, working for you? And what is your return yep. on equity? So if that return on equity, once we take them through a process of evaluating the return on equity, which I'm happy to share a tool with your listeners, I've got a free tool where they can get their own, uh, a, 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 you know, in just five minutes, plug in their numbers and identify their return on equity. But um, sure. we run them through that analysis. And if they're, if they're getting a poor return on the equity that they have tied up in that property, it's time to reposition that equity through an exchange, through a refinance or through a sale. And in some cases, the equity is performing just yep. fine and it should stay put. In many cases, it needs to be repositioned to get it working harder. And so that's what we did with a lot of our clients was sort of prep them saying, hey, you guys might want to consider exiting through a refinance or uh, through a sale and getting into these type of opportunities in a higher cash flow market that could pr provide better returns than what you were currently getting with the equity that was tied up in your properties. Sure. And that's exactly right. When you start gaining equity in your property, put it to work. Don't just, because honestly, the equity just sitting there is no better than just having cash in the bank. And both are susceptible to the cost of inflation, right? Because obviously, well, no, maybe not necessarily the equity because the equity is going to increase as inflation increases and the, the you're, you're continuing. Well, to what happens, guess, what happens is that over is, time, as you pay down your debt, your return on equity goes down. Okay. So as equity builds up, whether yeah. it be natural appreciation or forced appreciation, okay. As that equity builds up and you pay down your debt, over time, your return on equity is going to go down. That's why you often see refinances happening in three to five years, because it's time to reposition yep. that equity, get it working harder for you. So generally speaking, the, the risk is, and I have a lot of clients that are very risk averse. In many cases, I have clients that carry no debt. Um, they just won't do it. Now, I'm not a proponent of carrying no debt. I think that's one of the major benefits of investing in real estate, right? So what, yeah. what we do is we discuss what's a conservative amount of equity that you want to keep in the property. And if it's over that conservative amount, let's get that remaining equity, that trapped equity working for you. And so that's one strategy, right? Refinancing, yep. getting that back up to a comfortable level of debt where you're still safe, where you still have great debt service coverage. 
but you have this other equity that you can yeah. go and continue to build your portfolio. Yeah. And, and then, and then potentially even from there, diversify, diversify asset classes, diversify locations, diversify, whatever. Yeah. It you know what? I got to harp on that sense. too, because so. this is a conversation that I have with, with my clients. I can help one of my local clients go buy a, let's just use a fourplex because it's simple and people can wrap their heads around it. They can go in my market today, you're going to spend 800,000 to 1.4 on a fourplex. Okay. So you're plopping down, you know, at a minimum $200,000 to get yourself into a fourplex. That's great. And for many people, yep. that's optimal and it's the right move. And everybody's case, um, their desires and what they're trying to accomplish with their portfolio is going to be different. Someone that wants to be hands-on, wants to own something right in their backyard, maybe that person, a fourplex would be right for them in this situation. But you take that 200 grand and you're buying four doors, right? Four tenants, right? Four streams of potential yeah. income. Well, if one of those units go vacant, yep. all of a sudden, you know, you're only 75% occupied, right? Whereas if we're buying a hundred unit, a 200, a 300 unit apartment building, and we have, you know, 10 units go vacant, well, that's a different story, right? So you have a little bit of safety and scale in my opinion, yep. but here's the bigger uh, impact. You could take that 200 grand and plop it down on one building in one location with only four tenants, or you could take that 200 yep. grand and spread that out over four different investments, commercial grade property in four different locations with four different sponsors, four different asset types, and four different business plans. Extremely diversified. And that's what we do on the syndication yep. side is we basically partner. My goal for my investors is to give them a variety of investment opportunities across geographic locations, yep. across operators, and across business plans. And that's the one thing that always seems to get left out of, of a lot of people stop at diversify across operators. They don't realize that diversifying across operators also diversifies across business plans because there's, it's like a fingerprint. It always seems like no two operators run something exactly the same, no matter how efficient it's running. It seems like somebody always wants to change something a little bit. So anyway, all right, well, listen, uh, so David, we're kind of running out of time here, but I've got a few questions I want to ask you that are just uh, pertaining to you and what your likes are. And the first of those questions is what is the best book that you have recently read or um, who read? not how I believe that's the right title. Yeah. Who not how. Yeah. Um, that's a great book about building business through other people and, uh, putting people in place that have unique skill sets outside of yours. Um, I would also mention the one thing yep. by Gary Keller. Um, it's a great, uh, very simple concept, yep. but, but a very powerful concept about identifying the one thing that's ultimately going to have the greatest impact on the end result. And then focusing on that one thing and hammering away on that. Yep. Yep. And man, both great books. And I know I can tell from talking with you is like your, your sales experience and your syndication experience, how well they go hand in hand. And it's like each of those books kind of complements each of those skill sets, the sales and the, the networking part of the syndication. Although at the same time, they crisscross. I mean, they, they both can complement one another. So, all right. So the next question is, what is a dream vacation that you have either taken hmm. or hope to take? Yeah, I'm a pretty simple guy. Um, you know, we're heavy, heavy into okay. youth athletics. And so taking vacations isn't really top of mind for me. My ideal vacation, I which understand. we take once per year, is uh, going to Lake Powell for a week uh, on a nice houseboat with a handful of friends and family. Man. We take all of our kids. We got back just a, a few weeks ago oh. and uh, we had five families, like 40 kids running around and just a blast at Lake Powell. Yes. Yeah. Dude, I love Lake Powell. 
Lake Powell is probably one of the coolest places I've ever been in my life. And mm -hmm. we, uh, it was a church trip and we went and we took that, we rented a big houseboat, right? I'm sure that's what a lot of people do there. We rented a houseboat and all of us had to get up top and the guy no, drove over, it. We went back yeah. in a, yeah. I don't even know, I call it a cavern or something. And we all had to get up top and help guide the boat back into this thing. We we're back there by ourselves. Water's clear as you can clear as yeah. far as you can see down oh man oh man that place was yeah that's a good trip oh so spectacular so anyway awesome man <laughs> we just keep the things you and i have in common uh just more and more so, uh, the uh the uh all right man so listen um i know that there's some people out there who have heard what you've said and and are interested in possibly learning more about uh, your vision from the sales side or possibly your vision from the investor side, or, or maybe there's an investor out there looking to, to place their 200,000 in capital and, and they'd like to maybe get in touch with you. So what is the best way? Uh, I'll give them two ways. Uh, the first is you can get a free copy of our return on equity report, our return on equity calculator. So if you go to return on equity report, return on equity report.com, uh, you can uh, download a free copy of our uh, ROE calculator, which will allow you to just plug in your numbers of any property that you currently own, and it'll spit out what you're currently or what you should expect, potentially expect as a return on equity in the next three years. Um, then that can guide some decisions on what you do uh, with that sure. equity. So that's the first one. And then the second way is just go to canovocapital.com. That's C A N. O V O Canovo capital.com and just uh, join our investor network there. Um, uh, our team will reach out. We'll schedule a call. I'll jump on a call with you, talk to you about your goals, what we do on the syndication side of things. And uh, would love to chat with you. Awesome, man. Awesome. That's great. And I can't thank you enough for taking the time today to be with us. I know that you all are really busy over there. I know that especially in some of the markets you're in, that things are just booming and it's, 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 it's hardly, uh, it's hard to find time to, like you said, you're in youth sports. My kids are in youth sports. So I get that completely. But anyway, thank you so much for your time, David. And also uh, thank you for your, um, your, uh, the free resource that you've offered the listeners and listeners, please go get that uh, return on equity is a very, very important piece of this puzzle. So, and as always, please head down and leave us a five-star review. You. And while you're there, please hit the subscribe button so that you can be notified when we release episodes, when we release content and come back and visit us soon. Again, I want to thank you, David, so much for your time and listeners. Thank you for being with us today. Cashflow Pro is hosted by Casey Brown, founder and CEO of 3000 Capital, a commercial real estate investment firm committed to providing its investors with ongoing cash flow and helping them build long term wealth. If you enjoyed today's podcast, make sure to hit that subscribe button so you'll be notified about all our future episodes. You can find more information about us and our investment philosophy by clicking the link in the show notes below. Thanks for listening.